Pink Flamingo's Haunted UK podcast is recorded and presented in stereo. Listening to it through an environment such as headphones is highly recommended. Pink Flamingo's Haunted UK podcast is proudly sponsored by CDS Print and Design. For printed t-shirts, hoodies, canvases, coasters, placemat stickers, banners, signage and much, much more, contact Colin or Debbie at CDS Print and Design through Facebook, Instagram or email at cdsprintanddesign at gmail.com. With high quality products at competitive prices, what have you got to lose? We're currently asking you, the listeners, for your ghost stories and paranormal experiences for a set of listener episodes. Wherever you live in the world, if you've had an experience, then please email the show with full details of your story to Haunted UK Podcast at hotmail.com. I'd made my usual trip with my dog, in through the bottom gate off Hayseach Road, around the lower pool, up the hill to Hayden Hill House and Hall. It was around 7.15pm, and just as I'd made my way back down to the bottom gate, I noticed that there was nobody else around. The atmosphere had turned very strange, very odd. Then my dog barked. She was staring in the direction of the path opposite, and that's when I saw it. A white, misty figure that was moving along the path towards the pool. I was stunned. It had completely faded away by the time it had got to the trees. It took me a long time to go back into that park. Anonymous local resident. Welcome to Pink Flamingo's Haunted UK Podcast. This is episode 6 of Pink Flamingo's Haunted UK Podcast, and our destination this time is Hayden Hill Park and its two houses, Hayden Hill Hall and Hayden Hill House. Wherever you live, if you do a little research and some hunting around, you'll probably end up finding a haunted house or building or even a haunted park or woodland. When my family and I decided to move to the Halezoan area four years ago, we had no idea that just a few minutes' walk from our new home would be not only a haunted park, but also a haunted house. Possibly two. Hayden Hill Park contains landscape gardens, pools, woodland and beautiful walks which weave their way around the whole 55-acre site. The park is also home to two large houses, the 17th century Tudor-style Hayden Hill Hall and the Victorian Hayden Hill House. Bordering the park is Congreve's Nature Reserve, which is also home to Congreve's Hall. The parkland was built over the course of hundreds of years by the Hayden family, who can be traced as far back as the 13th century. They had been farmers for many years, but they seemed to prosper greatly in the 17th and 18th centuries, due to a string of shrewd land investments as well as marriages which injected a substantial amount of wealth into the family name. The main family house which watched over the land was what is now known as Hayden Hill Hall. This Tudor-style farmhouse was remodelled and extended a number of times, but what you see today was mainly from the 17th century. In 1877, the entire estate was passed down to George Alfred Best, who was born at nearby Congreve's Hall in 1839. One of the conditions of his inheritance was that he was to take the Hayden name, which he duly did. He was then known as George Alfred Hayden Best. George had grand plans for the whole farm. 
He wanted to completely remodel the house and its grounds into a scene from the grand style of the era. But before he could start any of these changes, he had a big problem. Hayden Hill Hall was still occupied by Mary Bars, who was entitled to keep the property because of marriage between the two families, the Bars and the Bests. George Hayden Best then decided to demolish the cottage on the estate which he was living in and begin building a grand new house. Hayden Hill House was soon completed, with many features that were very cutting edge at the time of building, such as piped gas and water supply, as well as underfloor heating and flushing toilets. Hayden Best's next project was to landscape the land into a parkland such as that of the aristocracy. Pools were constructed at the higher and lower sections of the land, as well as tree-lined pathways and driveways being planted. The focus was to emphasize the beautiful views of Clent Hills. George also still had a plan to extend Hayden Hill House when Hayden Hill Hall became vacant. But Mary Bars lived until 1904, and the additional building work never happened. Both Hayden Hill House and Hayden Hill Hall would stay as separate buildings. After George Hayden Best died in 1921, the estate remained in the family for just one year, but was then sold to the local council through public subscription for £8,500. Within the agreement of the public subscription was 55 acres of parkland as well as both Hayden Hill House and Hayden Hill Hall. Over the years, various modifications were made to the estate, such as the building of a swimming pool and a bandstand. Both of these structures didn't survive into present day, and coupled this with a devastating fire in Hayden Hill Hall, and the area was starting to fall into disrepair. In 1990, a renovation program was undertaken, but progress was very slow. But in 1999, fortune changed by way of a National Lottery Heritage Fund award for just over £2 million. A huge amount of restoration work began on not only the houses, but also the park. When the work was completed in 2007, Hayden Hill Park, House and Hall once again welcomed visitors into its beautiful grounds. With hundreds of years of history in its grounds, does Hayden Hill harbour a more darker, paranormal side not always seen? As with many old, large haunted houses, tales of secret passages and underground tunnels always tend to add to the eeriness of an already sometimes spooky building. Hayden Hill Hall is no different. Substantial tunnels have been discovered under the hall, but their exact lengths and destinations have never been confirmed. One story involving one of these tunnels tells the tale of forbidden love between a beautiful young woman named Eleanor and one of the Hayden family's sons. It's thought that Eleanor was the daughter of a miller who ran the Hayseach Mill, which was very close to the Hayden estate. Members of the Hayden family would have regularly seen Eleanor walking past the house, but one particular Hayden boy took great interest in her. Over time, they began to spend more and more time together, something which angered the Hayden family. They had other plans for their son. Hale Zoen Abbey was around two miles away and was home to an order of very strict monks. The Hayden family sent their son to join the order with hopes that he would take the life seriously and to also crush the love affair. This didn't go according to plan, as the young couple continued to see each other. After numerous secret meetings, however, word had gotten around that their love affair was still very much active. After one particular meeting, the pair were forced to retreat into the tunnels below Hayden Hill Hall. The monks of Helzo in Abbey were lying in wait and had finally caught up with the pair, but it was the Hayden boy who they were truly after. After realising that their efforts to find their missing companion were becoming fruitless, they decided to exact a horrid punishment. They bricked up the tunnel that they knew he was inside and left him down there to die. He was never seen alive again, and Eleanor spent the rest of her life pining for her long-lost love. Both of them have been seen wandering around the estate, 
presumably searching for each other, but more horrifically, screaming and wailing has been heard coming from the tunnels beneath the hall. With regards to the history of tunnels in the area, one legend tells of a tunnel which existed which stretched from Hales Owen Abbey to Hayden Hill Hall. This is a distance of around two miles, which would have made this feat of engineering hundreds of years ago highly unlikely. There has never been any evidence found of a tunnel from either property, but the legend still sounds amazing and mysterious. Another haunting tale took place inside Hayden Hill Hall. A young girl by the name of Anne Eliza Hayden had become the sole heir to the estate at only six years old, after her father, John Hayden, had passed away. John Hayden had married late in life at 65, when his wife, Mary Kendrick, was only 19. In the terms of the will, it stated that her mother and any children which she had would only benefit from the estate if Anne never had any children. Mary Kendrick soon remarried. At 17 years older than her, the Reverend George Bars had a vicious reputation that even made its way into his sermons at St Giles in Rowley Regis. A plan was soon hatched between Mary and George to strictly limit Anne access to the outside world, making sure that she would never be able to take a husband or have children. Friends of the family Visitors to the house and members of the public soon began to notice that Anne wasn't seen around the estate anymore. Inside Hayden Hill Hall, Anne was quickly becoming a prisoner to the estate which she actually owned. Many people reported seeing Anne peering through a window of the house, her skin very pale and her appearance gaunt. Anne died in 1876 and even after this, witnesses continued to report sightings of a very ill-looking girl staring out of the same window. This story and Anne's apparent confinement were given a gloss of truth when the house was handed over to the local council. When they began to go through Hayden Hill House, they were stunned to find a room with bars over the window and the window frame nailed shut. It became common knowledge that this was the room where the majority of the tragic life of Anne Eliza Hayden had been lived. It's not just the hall which has been the subject of ghost sightings and paranormal events. Hayden Hill House has its own haunted reputation. The house had an apartment which occasionally came up for rent, and in 1990, two male friends, John and Steve, both in their 20s, decided to apply to rent it. Their application was successful, and they soon moved in. They decided to invite friends and family over to take a look around, and immediately, strange things began to happen. The television set would flicker, as if stuck between channels. Strange, shadowy figures would look like they were walking past the screen. The sister of one of the male friends had gone down a corridor to the toilet. Her partner went looking for her, and saw a figure at the end of the corridor who he thought was his girlfriend, but noticed that this figure was smaller in height, and when she got closer, he noticed that she was wearing what looked like a Victorian maid's outfit, and was also carrying a tray. Rejoining the group, he asked about the Victorian maid, but nobody else had seen her. A few minutes later, his partner appeared and she commented that the atmosphere in the corridor and the toilet had become very oppressive, and the temperature had dropped dramatically. She also found that, for a brief amount of time, the toilet door wouldn't unlock. The apartment had two bedrooms, and the two friends, now realising that the property was exhibiting some strange behaviour, chose their rooms and hoped to settle in quickly. Activity in John's room began with a tapping noise which, at first, kept him awake for hours on end. Initially, John thought it was a draft blowing in through the gaps in the window frame, but on closer inspection, he saw that the cord which controlled the blinds was physically being pushed against the window. This soon became the norm for John, but one evening things went too far. Instead of the tapping noise, which had become steadily louder, John was woken up by a dragging sound which seemed to be coming from underneath his bed. He leaned over to his bedside table, and turned his light on, 
and was stunned and terrified to see his bag of diving weights being pulled by some invisible force towards his bedroom door. Steve's room didn't fare much better either. Sleepless nights were a regular thing due to the noise of tables and chairs being moved around in the cafe below his bedroom. This went on for weeks and got louder every night. It got so bad that Steve took to wearing headphones with music playing to try to help him drown out the noise. He even commented that sometimes the noise would seem to penetrate the headphones and become unbearable. On many occasions, both men would go downstairs to the cafe to investigate, only to be met with the sight of complete calm, with nothing out of place at all. It was in December 1990 that events would become too much for the two friends. After weeks of non-stop noise and sleepless nights, the pair began hearing a choir singing a requiem mass. This went on for a full week and got louder and louder. John and Steve finally gave in and moved out, leaving the apartment which had initially promised so much. After a little investigation, it was discovered that a choir was indeed brought in by the owner of the house in Victorian times, and a requiem mass was sung throughout December. Hayden Hill House is regularly open to the public, and thousands of visitors have wandered around the many rooms. Members of the public, especially children, have reported strange sightings and feelings whilst visiting, and one area that seems to provide experience after experience is the servant's staircase. On one occasion, a young girl commented to her mother that there was a woman dressed as a maid dancing around at the top of the stairs. And on another occasion, a child refused to walk any further up the stairs as they didn't like the look of the man standing at the top, staring down at them with a stern and angry look. In another case, a young child who was being carried around by their mother began to cry and scream when they got to the servant's staircase. The mother tried a number of times to climb the stairs, but on every occasion, her child became extremely upset. A member of staff offered to take them up the main house staircase so that they could take a look around the upper floors and avoid the servant's staircase entirely. But upon attempting to come back down via the servant's stairs, the child once again began to cry and scream. Members of staff have also had their fair share of experiences, with one happening in the middle of a family fun day. A young child witnessed a man climb over the no-entry signs on the stairs leading to the attic. The staff member thanked the young girl for reporting the incident and proceeded to go after the trespasser. The attic was an area which none of the staff members were comfortable going into, but fortunately for them, the access door was always locked, so if this man was still up the stairs, he couldn't go anywhere. Upon getting to the top of the staircase and trying the attic door, it was clear that whoever this man was, he didn't go back down the stairs, and he certainly couldn't get into the attic. He just disappeared. In an entirely separate incident, another member of staff had bravely unlocked the attic door to do some duties later in the day. As she made her way back up the stairs, she went to open the attic door, but it wouldn't budge. She turned the handle again and again and pushed against the door, but it still wouldn't open. It was then that she thought that she may have relocked it earlier, so she put the key in the lock and found that it was still unlocked. It was then that she was aware of an extremely cold draft coming from underneath the attic door, a draft that seemed to envelope her. The hairs on the back of her neck stood on end, and as the feeling was beginning to get worse, she decided to leave the door and make her way back downstairs to the office. Her colleagues commented that she looked shaken and very pale, but one of them offered to go back up to the attic with her and try the door. When they both got back up there, the door opened first time without any resistance whatsoever, and the temperature had returned to normal. Another strange incident occurred at the main house staircase to a lady who had been visiting the park and had decided to take a look around the house. She made her way to reception and asked what room boarded the staircase, as she could hear a man and woman having a loud and angry quarrel. A member of staff asked the lady to take her to the spot where she could hear this argument taking place. 
Upon arriving there, it appeared that the quarrel had been coming from a room which was not only empty, but also locked. Coming back to the story at the very beginning of this episode, we see that it's not only the houses that harbour tales of the paranormal. The 55 acres of Parkland also have tales to tell. So to round off this episode, we'll hear two stories of spirits who roam the Parkland. A new member of staff had been getting used to their duties when they decided to take a break. It was a beautiful summer's evening and almost twilight. The park was pretty much deserted and so it was very quiet apart from birdsong and a light breeze stirring through the trees. The staff member had taken a brief walk around and was looking out and admiring the views when he was snapped out of his moment of peace by the sight of a man approaching. He was very smartly dressed, but his clothes looked like they were from a bygone era. He was also reading aloud from a book, so being a helpful member of staff, he asked the man if he could be of any assistance. The man looked up from his book, took a moment, then asked the staff member if he believed in God. And did he think that children were turning their backs on not only God, but on religion in general? The staff member didn't really want to get involved in a conversation which could be quite sensitive, so he skillfully diverted the conversation away from the topic for a brief moment, but was then surprised by the appearance of a second man who seemed to have come from the direction of the house. This second individual instructed the member of staff to ignore the ramblings of the first man, and that he would be leaving soon enough. Giving this man a friendly smile, the staff member turned to the first man, but was amazed to find that he had vanished. Completely perplexed, he then turned back to the second man to ask what was going on, only to discover that he had also vanished, leaving the staff member alone and utterly confused. Had he really just witnessed these two individuals disappear? Walking back to the house, he was desperately trying to make sense of what had happened. As he walked through the door and down a corridor, he noticed a set of newly mounted framed photos on the wall. He'd never seen these photographs before, so took an interest but was shocked to see that in these photographs were the two men that he'd just been speaking to outside. They were both long, dead family members from the house's distant past. Were these two men simply out for a walk on a beautiful summer's evening? Was this, like many ghost sightings, a replay of a moment which had been captured in time and triggered by the member of staff? Our last story takes place on the lower grassy area by the larger of the two pools. It was in the 1960s and a local scout group were camping out near the shore of the pool. During those days, this type of activity was allowed and the park would host many other activities such as fates and community events. During the night, after everyone had gone to sleep, one young man woke up in need of the toilet. Moving as quietly as possible, so as not to wake anyone else up, he crept out of the tent. He was immediately aware of a blue glowing hazy light, which slowly took the form of a woman. The man was absolutely terrified and rooted to the spot. The apparition was in medieval clothes, complete with a bonnet, a veil and fully flowing dress. After a short amount of time, the relevance of what the witness was seeing dawned on him and he began to cry out to the rest of the scout group. Very soon, they were all awake and wondering what was going on, but by this time the apparition had faded away and it's not reported if any of the other members of the scout group saw the ghostly woman. She was, and is still known as the Blue Lady, and the strange thing about this particular ghost is that there doesn't seem to be any backstory to her existence whatsoever. That's not to say that something may have gone on in the past, a murder, an accident that simply wasn't recorded in history. Going back to the beginning of this episode, I mentioned that wherever you live, if you do a little research and some hunting around, you'll probably end up finding a haunted house, or building, or even a haunted park or woodland. Living so close to Hayden Hill Park and delving into the history of not only the park but the houses as well, makes you a little more aware of what your surroundings were like many years ago. 
the kind of people who lived, worked and died, all of them having no idea that in years to come they will somehow be immortalised as a ghost. I can't recommend enough to anyone who is visiting the area to take a walk around Hayden Hill Park, visit the houses and soak up the history. If you're part of a ghost hunting group, Dudley Council do let groups stay overnight and many investigations have taken place. Even most haunted visited and had amazing results during their stay. So if you're visiting for a walk around or if you're part of a paranormal investigation, just remember that when your Panasonic DR60 is set up and ready to record EVPs, you keep your senses on high alert because the next person that may have an experience could be you. Well, we've come to the end of episode 6 of Pink Flamingo's Haunted UK podcast. But before I go, I'd just like to make a few announcements. First off, thank you to all of you who've listened and if you've enjoyed the show, then please leave a 5-star review. This will help the show tremendously. You can find the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Breaker, Pocket Casts and Radio Public. Secondly, I'd like to give a shout out to the show's sponsor, CDS Print and Design. Thank you so much to Colin and Debbie. Thank you for your support. Thirdly, I'd like to give a shout out to a few podcasts which, if you're struggling to find interesting material to listen to, these will definitely quench your thirst. Wherever you download your podcasts from, try searching for the following. Astonishing Legends The Strange Sessions Haunted Housewives The Mystery of Life Podcast The Salty Speculation Podcast Killing, Missing, Hidden The Pineapple Pizza Podcast Podcasts from Fallen Scholar Productions and from the Parcast Network, who are now exclusively only on Spotify, Unexplained Mysteries, Conspiracy Theories, Gone, and Extraterrestrial. Next, if you've experienced a paranormal event at Hayden Hill Park, Hayden Hill House, or Hayden Hill Hall, or for that matter, anywhere in the world, then please email the show at hauntedukpodcast at hotmail.com. That's hauntedukpodcast at hotmail.com with full details of your encounter and I will try my best to read out as many listener stories as possible in dedicated listener episodes. I would genuinely love to hear from you, so please, get in touch. Last of all, if you have a podcast that you need mixing or if you need original music writing for your podcast, then please, get in touch via email to pinkflamingo.musicproductions at hotmail.com That's pinkflamingo.musicproductions at hotmail.com This podcast was recorded at Pink Flamingo Music Production Studio in Hales Owen in the West Midlands, England. For a full list of research sources that helped immensely with the content of this episode, please refer to the show notes. Thank you all so much again for listening. And we'll be back very soon with another episode. Until then, stay safe and take care.